Guys, welcome to the Jerry and Jerry Show. My name is Jerry Miller. Thank you kindly for joining us. We are live in downtown Charlottesville in our building, the Macklin Building, on a show right here on the I Love Seville Network with my friend, Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe, the star of the program, the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer. I see nine states literally watching us right now on this program, and it's no secret, Jason Williford is on set. The man makes us look good. Judah Wickhauer, if you can go to the studio camera and welcome Jay Willie to the program. This guy is a, a tremendous basketball coach, an ambassador for the University of Virginia. This guy loves some fantastic food. This guy loves football. And this guy is a media mogul. I could continue, Coach Williford, if you like. I could follow you around. How are you this Tuesday morning? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, you got me blushing on set. Um, no, it's, it's good to be here. Um, Hanging out with Hootie, we go way back. Uh, he covered me when I played, and uh, good to be downtown here in Charlottesville. Well, it's great to have you. Hootie set up this interview, and uh, I'm very grateful for this, uh, this setup right here, Jerry Ratcliffe. Well, we're so uh, lucky and fortunate to have somebody like Jason to come on the show. We, uh, like he said, we go way back. <laughs> um, I covered him when he played for Jeff Jones here, and they almost made it to the Final Four. We were really, really close in 95. Um, and I remember Jason as being the, what, what we sports writers described him as, as the glue of the team. He, he held that whole thing together and uh, played key roles in uh, a lot of successful basketball back in that era for sure and now he's he's brought that back to Virginia well it's great to have you how's the uh how's the off season I mean we're about to get into uh I mean what are you clocking 80 90 100 hours a week I mean what's what's the week look like during the season hour wise well you know so it's preseason, right um, we're we're in official practice now um so the guys are lifting going to class practicing study hall I'm recruiting uh, I'm trying to also follow my two young sons that are playing football at STAB. Uh, so I am being a coach, a dad, cheerleader, recruiter. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a lot of different hats, but it, it's fun. Um, but the guys are working, our, our guys, UVA's teams, working their butt off. Um, we're looking forward. We got the blue-white scrimmage coming up. Um, this weekend, so we're excited about that. Um, I think fans will be excited to see um, the new look Cavaliers. We got a lot of new pieces. You guys are loaded. Like, well, we're we're loaded with with young talent, um, transfer talent, um, but um, we're, we're athletic and long, and um, it's been fun watching this group. It, it, it's fun every year um, because you just don't know what each particular group brings. Um, but this is probably the first time we've had this many new pieces uh, between freshmen and transfers and um, guys that, you know, either redshirted, Leon Bond was a redshirt. Uh, so excited to see what we got going on. Yeah, well, I thought before we got into the basketball stuff, we'd talk about something real serious and about the Pittsburgh Steelers. You still got a smile on your face from that win Sunday over the Ravens. Yes, sir. I know a, you're a huge Steelers fan. I'm a diehard. <laughs> um, and it's been, it's been rough sledding watching our offense barely score. Um, but that defense stepped up Sunday. We got a huge win against the Ravens. And I say we as if I'm – you know, in the in the office, in the locker room, on the field. Um, but I love those Steelers. Um, so we're in first place, at least with five weeks into the season. I can I can brag about being in first place uh, in the AAFC North. Um, but beating Baltimore, I love beating them. <laughs> Anytime we can beat them, it's always smash mouth, physical, low scoring, old school football, which I love. My son is a huge Steelers fan as well, and, and he has he shares your sentiments about the Ravens, that's for sure. <laughs> well, it, it, the, the kids know. I, my kids, my the kids at UVA all know that if if the Steelers lose, I'm not in a good mood. So that I go week to week during football season with my Steelers. So uh, the guys are always hoping that the Steelers win. 
Don't ask, last, don't ask Dad for any presents if the Steelers <laughs> lose. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know the feeling. So I'll throw this to you. What's the, uh, what's the offseason like for you? I mean, you, you mentioned your sons. They're obviously standout athletes. What, what do you do in the chill time, the downtime? How do you spend the... Uh, how do you spend those months, those precious months before the season starts? Well, they're really hitting the off season because we're, we're constantly recruiting. You know, it, it, I shouldn't say constantly. The months of, of April, June, July, we're on the road recruiting. Um, but I also get to see my boys play. They, they both play AAU basketball. Uh, so I get to travel, watch them. I get to recruit. But I enjoy fishing and golfing so if I could ever sneak away to golf which is seldom uh, and I'm no good but I love the game I, I try to get out and golf a little bit but I love fishing I, I you know salt water fresh water um, you know I'll drive down to Virginia Beach and go out um, we'll go little places here locally I take my boys like that is our getaway whenever we can we can fish uh, and golf um, so that's kind of my, my chill time, I, just family time, being, being with my kids, being with my wife. Um, you know, my folks are in Richmond, so being, being able to go see mom and dad, um, that's always kind of my getaway. What's no good at golf? 80? No, 78? No, 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 75? No, no. I wish. If I, if I was shooting 80, I might retire at basketball and, and play golf all the time. I am... I'm, Definitely in the in the high 90s and shooting 100 most times. Um, a good day for me is when I don't lose over six balls. If 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 I can lose less than two sleeves, that's a good day. There you go. <laughs> Your favorite courses, Coach? Ooh. So uh, I like Burwood. They made it extremely difficult. Um, Keswick is probably uh, one of my favorites. I I golf. I live really close to Meadow Creek, uh -huh. so I, I go over there as, as, as often as I can. Um, but I've played everywhere locally. Um, but, but I would say Keswick, Birdwood, Old Trail are my favorites here. Some of your favorites, Hootie. Yeah, I love all those courses for sure. Um, it's hard to beat them. <laughs> and Birdwood, I like what they've done with Birdwood. It's way too difficult. It's, it's, it's hard. not easy, that's for sure. Well, yeah. And Davis then, Love got his hands on it. I know, I know. But then, then, then you go play with Tony, who's like a, a, well, he probably was like a four or five handicap. Get out. And he wants to play the tips. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that is extremely difficult. Um, but, you know, we, we have like Orlando Vandross on staff. He's, he's got the golf bug. Ron Sanchez, who's now back with us, he golfs. Tony likes to golf. Tony's more into tennis. I, I'm not a tennis guy, uh, but 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 just being out on the golf course is fun. He's getting props from Kevin Yancey in Waynesboro, Chad Woods watching the program. I got 11 states on the feed watching Coach Williford. Hootie, I know you got something on the mind. Yeah, uh, switching over to basketball a little bit, and and uh, I agree with you about golf. It's that's my release. That's my escape from the rest of the world. So. Uh, I'm it's passionate. A good, it's a good four hours. It is. D depending on how, how quick you can. Four, sometimes a little less. Yeah, depending on how many it's not back people up. are in front of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, just, just switching over to basketball a little bit. Um, obviously, you're excited about the return of Reese Bigman, and I know he tested the NBA waters and – just to get some feedback from the pros about how to improve his game. What, what have you seen from Reese since he's returned? And uh, I know you haven't practiced long, but <laughs> what, what, what have you seen from him that might be a little different? You know, I think he's, he's taken on that leadership role. I think, um, you know, being more vocal, um, trying to encourage – uh, and, and, and teach the, the new guys, uh, the transfers, the, fr the first years. Um, he's been very much more vocal than he has in the past. Um, but I, the biggest thing um, is kind of his confidence, having come back from the combine. Um, you know, you, you go in, you're going against some of the best, you know, at, at your position in the country, all trying to make it to that next level. Um, and so I think you come back with a sense of, hey, I'm, I'm pretty good. 
you know, I've, I've, I've gone mm-hmm. through this. Um, so there's a confidence about him. Uh, there's that leadership um, that he's taken on. Um, and he's just being more assertive, which we need. And it's, it's, we're extremely uh, excited and thankful that he chose to come back for one more. This is his team. No, no question. Yeah. No question. Um, I was stunned yesterday that uh, Andy Katz, I, I don't know who he works for now, but he listed the top ten defenders in the country. <laughs> Ridiculous. And didn't have Reese Bigman included, which is a sh- sham because Reese is the defending ACC Defensive Player of the Year. You don't get any better But than you that. know what, guys? I, 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 I love it. I love when people don't count us. You know, they count us out. They think we're not. I, I love it. You know, yeah. I, I, I like uh, I like having that chip on our shoulder. Um, I you know I don't read. I probably don't read nearly half the stuff that you guys read well, uh, when it comes yeah. to those things. But I'm sure Reese probably has seen that, and uh, that's just uh, some some fuel to the fire. Um, and and it's a good thing. You know, we we like that. We like that underdog, Rocky mentality. Absolutely. Daniel Decker Jones watching the program. Oh. Oh, there you uh, go. Coach's wife right Dene. there uh, watching the show. We love we love uh, the fans watching the show. Questions are coming in. Um, let's let's go to Greenwood, Virginia, right now for Coach Williford. Twenty years from now, what do you want your players to remember about their time with you, Coach? Oh, uh, that uh, that I always had their backs. Um, that it was fun. Uh, and that I, I kind of was an example of uh, what it was um, like to be um, a, a good coach, a good mentor, good father. Like just just let them see how I live daily, good husband, um, that, that hopefully I can be a role model. I would have been a role model for them. Um, this is a good question that's coming from Richmond, Virginia, Westside Richmond. Reese Beekman, his upside is off the charts. Steven says, what would you like to see him improve upon to improve that draft stock even more? That's a great question. Great question. Um, and from my hometown, the RVA. I see that. Way to stand up. 804 in the house. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think he's got to be assertive. I think Reese has got to um, put this team on his back. Um, and he's got to score when we need him to score, defend like crazy, and just lead. Uh, I think if he can do those those things, um, I think his stock will, will will increase. We'll get to the the newbies in a while. Like you said, you you guys have so many new faces um, because of the transfer portal in the world we live in these days. But let's talk a little bit about the guys that are coming back: uh, Isaac McNeely, Leon Bond, um, Ryan Dunn, Ryan Dunn, Tane Ryan Murray. Tane Murray. Uh, That's probably it. Yeah, I think that is it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that's it's crazy yeah. out there, yeah. but those guys, uh, those guys, I, I think they're going to have their best years ever, don't you? Yeah, well, we need them to. Yeah, it, they they better, Jerry. Um, so McNeely and and Bond have the most experience outside of Reese, and then Tane played sparingly uh, over his last two years, um, and Leon Bond redshirted. Those guys have all been good. They've all made a made a, a jump in their play. Um, they worked their tails off this off season, this summer. Um, you know, they've got to now make that jump, mm-hmm. each and every one of them, uh, for this team to to go where we want to go. Um, but I, I think they're they're up for the challenge. Um, they'll have a chance to <laughs> to prove themselves. Uh, just because, I mean, I think it's those. Leon, Tane, uh, Isaac, Ryan, and Reese are, are the only five returners. Yes. Um, so uh, they'll have an opportunity, um, and you know they they've got to make the most of it. But but the, so far they all have been good. They all have improved. Um, now we've got to go do it. We saw glimpses of what Dunn could do at certain points last year. He's already being talked about as a possible first round yeah, draft I wish, choice. I, I, I wish they stopped all of that talk. <laughs> and they're already uh, comparing him to DeAndre Hunter. That's, I mean, that, that's a whole lot of pressure. It's to put bananas. On a young man. Yeah, I that's, know. A, that's a lot of pressure to put it on a young man. Right. Um, you know, he he's going to be good. 
he absolutely puts you in the in the in the the mind frame, the the mold of a DeAndre, of a Braxton, guys that are, are, are multi positional guys. Um, you know, I tell I, I tell him uh, to just put the blinders on, don't read any of the press clippings, um, don't listen to everything you hear, and kind of just go play, enjoy this, and let the chips fall where they may. That is a ton of pressure, um, but it, you know. Ultimately, that's where he wants to go, but I think uh, he, he's just got to block it out, um, play, produce, and, and we'll see what happens. I'll throw this to Coach. With social media, are the players more in tune with what's out there, oh, the absolutely. noise, absolutely. than you are? I mean, put that in perspective. Absolutely. It's, it, I see it in my house. So with your boys? It, with my boys. Okay. So it's a function of today's youth. Uh, and I include the college kids as our, our youth. Sure. Um, I understand what social media is, um, but I think our kids live and die by it. They're constantly on their, on their phones. So yes, they are aware. Um, so as, as coaches, as, as the father, as an adult, I try to, hey, enough, put it aside. It doesn't mean anything. But it's so immediate, and, and fans can be brutal. Uh, of course, they show love, um, but you get immediate um, results because of social media um, and feedback. And so um, our kids see it all. You know, we try to, to help them navigate that, um, but. Heck, sometimes that's the only way I can get my kids' attention. I have to send them a text message. <laughs> they won't pick up the phone to talk. Uh, so uh, it is what it is. We're, we, we live in that world, um, but you've got to put it in perspective. You've got to put social media in perspective. It, I don't know if I could have handled it. You know, Coming from where I come from, the, the, the fiery, feisty guy, I, I may have gotten into a whole lot of uh, social media fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I would have uh, invited them to meet me somewhere. Um, and, I wouldn't and, mess with you. And, and let's handle it uh, face to face. Um, there, there are a lot of brave social media folk. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure they're, they're brave when they get in your face. That's that's for sure. We see that all the time. Um, yeah, it seemed like last season down the stretch. Even in some of the games that you guys won, the, the three-point shooting kind of let you guys down. I, I don't think it's going to be a problem this year because of the influx of players. I mean, this you is got Micah coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm knocking on wood. Yeah, yeah. I'm knocking, yeah. I'll knock on yeah. wood. But I'm knocking to you. Yeah, you just gave us the jinx of the year. Woody. Um, no, you got you got McNeely. You, you got Rody coming in. Yeah, and uh, Jacob Groves from out in Oklahoma. He could tear it up at points last. We should be improved in that area, and, that, and, and that's something, um, you know, we've struggled over the last couple of years, you know, shooting, um, especially as the season, um, you know, went further into the season as it waned. Um, we've just got to have our guys play with confidence, shoot it with confidence, believe, trust their stroke, um, and, you know, hopefully the ball goes in. I mean, we're, we're going to get them shots. They've got to just step up and, and shoot them. But, you know, we, we've gotten some guys in the program now um, that can stretch the floor and help us. Um, let's knock on wood. You didn't jinx us in the ball. I don't believe in jinxes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you're right. If you can shoot, you can shoot. That's right. <laughs> Players make plays. How about uh, Dante Harris? Give us a snapshot on Dante. This kid's a baller. Big time uh, on-ball defender. I, I'm going to say something. And, and I may get myself in trouble. Uh, he's got the potential to be a better on-ball defender than Kihei Clark. Wow. Wow. That's, um, that he's, is big. he's as quick, maybe quicker. And he's got five inches on him. And he's and, and he's strong. He's a pit bull. Like, he is – he don't have five inches. What do you call him? Three and change? Four? Yeah. <laughs> he's listed at six. No, he, he – that's <laughs> generous. We call him five that, ten? That, that, that's generous. <laughs> okay. Um, but he's 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 a um, very good can touch the paint, good finisher, good mid range shooter. Um, but he will help 
solidify our defense, especially at on ball. Uh, he, he's got a chance to be really good. Uh, I, I, I don't want, I don't know if I should say it, but uh, I put myself out there. Kihei was a hell of a defender. Oh yeah. But this kid, this kid, um, his quickness is a little bit quicker than what Kihei had. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's quick. It, it's scary. Yeah. That's big time right yeah. there. We got uh, a lot Learn. of questions coming in for Coach. Six minutes, so we'll pick up the pace in tempo with Coach Wilford. Um, Olivia Branch is watching in Keswick. She <laughs> says, Jason is an amazing role model coach and an all-around great young man. Well, you're getting a young man from Olivia I Branch right tell, there. Tell Olivia, thank you. Olivia, thank you. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> she is an amazing woman. Yes, we love you, Olivia Branch. Yes, watches is. all our shows. Um, Rob Craig watching the program. He wants to know the impact Coach Chance has, has had on his return back to Virginia basketball. You know, Ron brings uh, now head coaching experience. He's, he's worn that hat. Uh, he's going to help Tony. He's helped our recruiting. We've actually uh, uh, get, got a kid committed that Ron has helped uh, solidify uh, from the West Coast. So um, he'll, he'll, he's always been a phenomenal recruiter. So. Uh, I, I expect that to continue, um, but just you know, his ability to see things from a head coach perspective helped Tony with those decisions. Um, you know, he—it's he, almost as if he, he hadn't left. Uh, he's picked right back up uh, where, where he left off when he was here the first time. Oh, well, I was going to ask you, even though it's several years removed from 2019, let's go back there just for a moment and. Uh, talk about humanizing Jason. I, what was it like climbing up that ladder, <laughs> cutting down the net? Um, how long did you just kind of soak it all in that moment? The moment it was it was surreal. Um, and you and I'm not sure I've really stepped back and had a chance to appreciate what we did. Um, it was huge for the program. It, my biggest memory um, was was being on stage, holding the trophy, and I wasn't at the front of the stage. I was at the back, and somehow I got the trophy, and I I just held it up to all of the fans that were were behind us. And for me, that was the biggest, you know, the basketball alum, you know, the guys who helped pave the way for this program, mm -hmm. all of our alumni. Um, for me, that was um, it. It was important for for me to like them to feel the love, um, and so um, being up there was was unbelievable. I always thought coming back as a coach that UVA had a chance to do what we did in, in nineteen. I said there was there's no reason we can't be. Um, as good as anybody in the country with this school, the facilities, um, the people that, that back us. I, I always thought that. Mm -hmm. um, as a player, we were close. Um, and so I, I, I knew that we could someday do it and to be up there, hold that trophy. You know, for me, it was for all of, all of the alum, for, for, for everyone that supported UVA, UVA Athletics, um, all the former players, not just you know our players, but all the players, uh, you know over the, over the decades that that helped pave the way and laid the foundation for what's now UVA basketball. I mean that was that was that was the best feeling for me. We did it. We finally did it for them. It was awesome. It was yeah. awesome. We got our two minute offense here. We're yeah. approaching the 10.45 marker here. Okay. I'd love to go uh, rapid fire with Coach Williford. Um, I'd love to throw maybe some questions back and forth to him real quick. Who's the best basketball player you've ever played against or coached? Oh, played against head-to-head -head would be Grant Hill. That go. was my mm -hmm. matchup. Um, and, yeah. How about coached? They're, they're all really good. <laughs> <laughs> Coach I like that. That was a good answer. I won't push on that one. Who do you rack with? Your turn. <laughs> uh, what, what's your favorite food? Ooh. Uh, anything. 
<laughs> I eat it. Look at me, Hootie. I, I, I got to lose weight. I love food. Uh, and Charlottesville is a really good food town. How about favorite yes. restaurant? Ooh. Maya. Oh, so good. Dooners. Yeah. Are my favorite. Uh, those, those are pretty good restaurants yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Have you ever asked for an autograph and from who? Um, I no, I not one on one. I've asked Potsy Ferrier, James Ferrier, to get the Steelers, the collection of them, defense, offense, everybody, to sign a helmet, and that helmet's in my office. So I, I, I. Kind of roundabout way, I've gotten an autograph, but not 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 an individual. So Potsy came through for Potsy you. came through, awesome. except Big Ben didn't sign it. I'm, ben, I need you to sign. It. <laughs> you <laughs> heard that? Pittsburgh Steeler of all time. Ooh, all time Steeler, great. Um, I'm going with my two UVA boys, Heath Miller and James Ferry. Those are my favorite. Heath Miller's fantastic. I actually saw him the other day. Two more, Hootie. Heath. <laughs> Two more. Wow. Uh, favorite band of all time? Band? Uh, I'll go with uh, the Roots Crew. You know who they are? Yes, I do. All right. Hootie, you know them? I do. Uh, very right. nicely done, right. Hootie. Right. Uh, last question here. Message for Wahoo Nation with the season right about to start. Come support us. Um, come out. Cheer. Go on the road uh, and just be patient. We're a work in progress, uh, but you're going to love the finished product. I love it. This was a fantastic interview. We got you out on time, Coach. Thank you kindly for thank joining you. us. Thank you. It was truly a pleasure. Jerry, thank you. UVA men's basketball guys support this team. We bleed orange and blue. They do it right. Judah, if we go to the studio camera, Coach Williford, if you want to go that way, thank you kindly for Jerry, joining thank us. Thank you. Thank we you. Appreciate you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, for, those, think, for those that are asking, the show will be archived wherever you get your podcast. We still got football to chatter. Thank you, Coach. Um, Jerry Rackett, that was a fantastic interview right there. Yes, it was. It was a lot of fun. I always enjoy uh, being around Jason and talking about old times and new times. And uh, I tell you, he's, he's just a, a great guy, a great uh, person to know. And he's been a tribute, uh, a, a, not a tribute, but he's just been a, a great ambassador for the University of Virginia ever since he stepped foot on grounds back in the early 90s. Um, what was he like as a player? Tough. Tough, very tough. Um, <clears throat> he had leadership qualities. He wasn't the star of the team. The guys like Corey Alexander and Jay Junior Burrow and some of those guys were the – Harold Dean, some of those guys were the ones who could light it up and stuff. But Jason was always there. He would always get you what you needed. And like I said, he was a tough customer. You didn't want to go in the middle and mix it up with him. And uh, – he always got the job done, and, and and like I said, he was the glue guy. He kept all those guys together, kept their egos intact, and um, he played a huge role in, in some of those great Jeff Jones teams. Stephanie Wells-Rhodes watching on LinkedIn. She says, wahoo, wah. Amen, Stephanie. This team absolutely loaded. I mean, I, you know, I understand Coach um, – he wants to keep uh, expectations in check at the beginning of the year. But I'm looking at this roster, and we've highlighted this on previous shows. They look absolutely loaded right here in the preseason. They certainly have a chance, and, I, you know, I, I think I think they're going to be better than last year's team. They, they might not win the ACC regular season title because um, I think there's probably more good teams at the top than there was a year ago. But I think this team could go deeper in the postseason just because of the talent on hand. There's, there's depth, uh, proven depth. The, I mean, they've, they've won at other places. And, and uh, one of the, th the things I really like about this team is, like I'm, we discussed earlier, they have guys who can put it in the basket. And I thought that's where they've struggled the last couple of years is Jason – reiterated that there's no substitute uh, for good shooting and and it can make up for a lot of other things that you might not have but they, they've got some guys who can light it up they've lit, lit it up other places and uh there's certainly no reason they can't do it here. I 1,000% agree with you. Not only do they have shooting to spread the floor, they have a couple of guards that can put the ball on the deck 
and go to the rack yeah. um, and to either finish at the hoop or go to the free throw line or kick out to some of these jump shooters. Um, questions are coming in for Hootie Ratcliffe, the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, about interior play. Where's the post play going to come from on this roster? Well, uh, Jordan Miner transferred in uh, from a lower mid-major school, and um, I think some of it's going to come from him. Uh, Blake Buchanan, a 6'10 freshman, um, I've seen him playing a couple of games in high school, and I know it's a jump to the ACC, but he's a big physical kid. He can also shoot it. Uh, he can score. Uh, so I, th I think that's probably where the most of it will come from. Although Ryan Dunn it plays bigger than his size, and I think Leon Bond has uh, really upped his game during his redshirt season. And from what I hear, he's, he's just been a real stud. You got, and you got uh, Jacob Groves, who not only can shoot it from outside, but um, he's a, a pretty good sized kid, and he can be physical when he needs to be. So I, I think they got plenty of guys who will have a presence down in the paint. Uh, Christopher's watching outside Chicago, and he's got a question for you, Jerry Ratcliffe. Last year's team seemed to be a really plotting team that got into half-court sets and tried to run the offense around Jaden Gardner. This roster looks like it's much more athletic. Does Ratcliffe, called him Mr. Ratcliffe, he prefers Hootie or Jerry, viewers or listeners, does Jerry see this team being more up-tempo to utilize the athleticism, especially in the backcourt and on the wing? That's a hell of a question. Well, it'll... Under Tony, it's only going to be so much up-tempo, right? They'll run at points when they have the opportunities, but <clears throat> I think that it will be a little bit more up-tempo, but not. Uh, let's don't go crazy here. They're not going to be running and gunning like North Carolina or somebody like that, but I, th I think they will. They are more athletic, um, and they have more guys that can hurt you. And so I, I think that they will open it up a little bit just because that they have the talent to do so. Last year, I think at times they had to play a little more conservatively because some of those guys weren't the most athletic in the world, and, and plotting is a good word because that's all they could do. But these guys, these guys are uh, mobile and hostile. I, th I think they'll be able to up the tempo a little bit. Um, Jerry Ratcliffe, the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer. we got to switch to football right here. A win... For Tony Elliott, snaps a losing streak, what, his fourth win in his second season at the University of Virginia, uh, 14 points. Um, I don't believe in ugly wins. I believe in a win is a win is a win, especially when you're trying to snap a losing streak. And I love to highlight the positives, and I think it starts under center with Tony Musket. It, it does, and I think this – past game gave us a little bit more indication of what he's all about he was able to play the whole four quarters and even though he got sacked four times he and he was under duress a lot um, he handled it better I think uh, we showed or we saw what a, a leader he is how resilient and tough he is uh, he took some hits. Big time hits. And then... Uh, and he's all, not 100% healthy. No. He's playing with pain. And that's okay with him. He's uh, he's more than willing to do that. And we, we saw that on the fourth and four when he took off with it and stretched out to get the first down and uh, ting, twing, uh, tweaked that shoulder or whatever it was that... Uh, had given him problems earlier in the season, caused him to miss three games. But, uh, you know, he came to the sideline, went in the medical tent. A lot of people said, oh, man, you know, he's he's probably done for the day, if not maybe the season. And instead, he came back out and one, one, missed one play, came back out and threw a, the touchdown pass that iced the game. So um, we talked to him after the game and – He's such an inspirational kid, a man of strong faith, and he's just tough and resilient, and, and, and that's what leaders are. He's mentally tough, not just physically tough. Um, Wahoo Nation, very passionate about Anthony Calandria and the Moxie he showed. 
Wahoo Nation now seeing the upside and potential of Tony Musket. We have a situation, I don't even know if that's the right word, we have a, on our hands are two quarterbacks that have some upside. Musket's got a year left in this program. Anthony Calandria is a first year. I'll start open-ended with you. How does Coach Elliott manage a first year with upside with the transfer who's got another year left to play next season? Well, it can be a tricky situation, as we've seen in, in modern-day college football with the transfer portal. Um, we have to assume, and, and when, when Musket went out and they sent in Brosterhouse, who uh, is a reserve quarterback, we all figured, well, you know, what the, we, we knew that Calandria had already appeared in four games, which is allowable, and you can do that and still keep your red shirt as long as you don't play in a fifth game. And so they, we realized at that point they were trying to protect him. We assume that they've had that conversation with Calandria, although we never, we never got that confirmed, but we assume that that conversation has taken place. And it's their plan to red shirt him this year. However, if Musket would have to go out and miss any length of time, there will be no hesitation in burning that red shirt year and going with Calandria. So it's, it's an interesting plan. Um, we hope that Musket can stay healthy and, and have a good rest of the season, second half of the season. If not, Calandria is ready to go. And it, that's a comforting thing for Tony Elliott and Des Kitchens, knowing that you got, like you said, two capable quarterbacks that can move the chains. We'll see down the road. If, if Calandria, if they're just doing that and, and he hasn't said that's uh, okay with me, then they're taking a risk because certainly there's going to be people coming after him with a fury, uh, and they may anyway. Uh, just as a temptation, trying because we we know there's all kinds of tampering going on in college football. So uh, it, I, I, it's up to the kid and and what he has agreed upon or whatever with the coaching staff. I think that is um, an on point analysis. Um, I was watching the game with my family in the stands behind the end zone, and I was surprised that Calandria did not came in come into the game. And then at that moment, I realized, all right, they're going after a red shirt here. How do you have, I'll, I'll rephrase the question. You have an 18 year old whose biggest strength, one of his biggest strengths, may be his confidence and his moxie. I would imagine Calandria anytime a football game, probably any sporting event is going on, he's got the mindset that he's the best at whatever the, the sport is. And that is a talent, that is something that you need to perform at the highest levels. Mm -hmm. So how do you tell an 18 year old you're not going to play for the rest of the year, and you're potentially entering training camp the following year, fighting for the job or the backup to Tony Musket. That's a very um, tight needle to thread. It truly is, and as the years have progressed, uh, the last couple, last it used to be just quarterbacks in the portal. Now everybody's going, but quarterbacks are a premium. Obviously, it's hard to win in college football or pro football if you don't have a really, Heck, high school really good quarterback. Yeah, high school football. And each level gets even more important. And he has proven that he can play. He hasn't proven he can win, but he's proven that he can do his part of the job. Uh, he's, certainly he's made some mistakes along the way. But it's it's tough. It, it depends on the kid and and what he wants to get out of college. Uh, he may love UVA and may want to be around this program for the rest of his career. Uh, he may get impatient and say, I want to go somewhere where I can start and play. And Because everybody wants to play, and especially if you're a guy who can put up numbers like he has. Uh, again, we assume they've had that discussion with him and not just doing it without consulting him. Um, but you know, even if they have, and he, even if he agreed to it, you never know who's in his ear, who has his ear, and the temptation is always there to go where the grass is greener. We we see it all the time. Virginia's lost some really good players through the portal, picked up a few too, but um, they've been they've been hurt from the portal more than they've been helped.
This is a good question from, so questions are coming in fast and furious. This one from Chad Wood. Um, Chad Wood in Crozet. Hootie, I'm looking at the offer list for a lot of commits and they don't seem to be impressive on paper. Would we not benefit more by hitting the portal and not necessarily relying on subpar high school recruiting talent? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Although you got to understand too that Virginia can't go out and do like Deion Sanders did at Colorado and bring in a whole new football team uh, because a lot of these transfer portal guys, a lot of their credits won't transfer to the University of Virginia. And so that cuts down on the, the pool, the talent pool, the available pool uh, uh, quite a bit for Tony Elliott and his staff. But there are p plenty of players in the portal, so it's up to you to do a great job recruiting and researching and finding guys that fit your program, fit your needs. And, yes, it, it is simpler to fill those holes with transfer portal guys guys than to try to go out and recruit them. And he's right. You know, some of the recruits they've gotten, gained commitments from, their list of schools hasn't been overly impressive. And some of, the, some of them have. There's just a handful of guys who's been recruited by some really good programs or programs at least as good or better than Virginia. So... Um, that, that's that's something that they've got to get a handle on. I know that Cam Robinson, the kid, the four-star from Tappahannock, they, they hope to get some momentum recruiting in the state of Virginia through him, and he's already proven to be everything they thought he was, if not more. He's leading the team, leading all the freshmen in the country in tackles from his middle linebacker spot. So... Uh, they need to get more guys like him into the program if they want to advance it like George Welsh did uh, 40 years ago. Um, Spencer's watching the program. Looks like in western North Carolina on the heat map. And he says, Hootie, if you were a betting man, does Calandria stay or go? Does he transfer or will he be on ground second year? Well, I'm assuming they had a conversation with him. I don't think they would have just knowing Tony Elliott as much as he cares about his players, I, I don't think he would have made that decision without talking to Calandria, and, I, and that Calandria must be okay with it. So I, if I were a betting man, I would say that, yes, he's going to stick uh, because he knows he's one play away from starting again. And uh, it's a very physical game. It, it's unusual. It's, we see quarterbacks getting hurt all the time. So... Um, I think he's probably here to stick it out and see see what happens. And, uh, you know, who, who knows if, if Musket does get hurt, uh, he'll be the man. Uh, he may play so well that even if Musket would return, there's no guarantee that Calandria would, wouldn't still be starting. I mean, he could end up being the all-time leading passer in Virginia history with the start he's gotten off to. So... Uh, I, th I think if I had to put money on the table right now, I would say that he's going to stay. Uh, this question's come in, and this one is from South Florida, Malik Washington. Please ask Hootie about this playmaker, and is he one of the best that he's seen covering Virginia football? He's certainly uh, in there. I mean, he, has, he already has four 100-yard games <clears throat> in, in six games, and the record for a season with, with that is six and the career record is nine by Jermaine Kroll and Chris Bird. So, Jermaine Kroll uh, played in the National Football League. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, he's off to a flying start. I, I thought he would be good because in the spring game, I saw him make some a couple of really nice moves. And on one kick return, he showed amazing speed and the ability to run in open spaces. And so I really liked what I saw. I thought he would be pretty darn good this fall, but he's even surpassed my expectations. Um, he had a couple of nice games at Northwestern where he almost had 100 yards, but uh, had, didn't crack that figure until he got here. But uh, I, I like the fact that he can get open, he's got good hands, and when he gets the ball, he knows what to do with it. He, he runs like a running back, not a a wide receiver. And I, I asked him about that. I said, you seem to get everything out of 
your runs after you, after you catch it. And he said, well, he said, man, I'm, I'm five foot nine and uh, 190 pounds or whatever. He says, I gotta, I've got to figure out some way to get through them or around them or something. But um, he, he is a heck of a playmaker. And uh, it would be nice if they could develop a third receiver to take some of the pressure off of him and, and homegrown talent Malachi Fields so th that will open up their games a little bit more. Um, this is from jerryratcliffe.com. Washington woke up today ranked in the nation's top 10 in several FBS categories. Number four nationally in receiving yards was 668. Number seven in receiving yards per game at 111.3 a contest. Number 10 in receptions per game at 7.3 a contest. And he's tied for number 20 nationally in receiving touchdowns with five. That on jerryratcliffe.com. Where does he stack up with some of the best receivers you've seen in the orange and blue? You wow. put Herman Moore one? Yes, Herman Moore's one. There's, there's been some really great receivers here, including uh, a couple of nice tight ends and Heath Miller and Jelani Woods. Um, there, there's been so many good ones. So I, he, he's got to be in the top ten for sure, even though he's only been here for half a season so far. But uh, he, could, he could break a couple of records uh, in just one year on the job. But – He's really good. He's. Uh, I wondered what they were going to do with with Billy Kemp transferring to Nebraska. I saw him on TV the other night, but they needed somebody to play that slot and be as effective as Billy was. And I think the year he's having right now, he's having a better year than Billy did. This is a great question right here. Who's got more upside from an NFL standpoint, Malachi Fields or Malik Washington? Wow, that's a tough question because they're – Different players. Completely different players. Yeah. I mean, Malachi Fields, 6'4", 220, where Washington's 5'8", buck 94. And as you've highlighted, I mean, he's got some slot potential. You don't see a ton of 5'8", wideouts in the National Football League. No, and, and he would play the slot, I'm sure. Um, but he has good hands. He has good speed, NFL speed. Uh, and I, like I said, he runs like a running back once he gets the ball in his hands. Malachi is a guy who can go deep. Uh, he's a guy who can run the fade, particularly in the end zone, go up and beat defensive backs for the ball. Uh, I think they both have NFL potential, so uh, I don't know if I would rate one over the other. Uh, it just depends on what teams would be interested in them. Sometimes it's it's not you, it's the place that you're going to if you fit in their system and if they can find ways to use you in their offense. So I, I think there's uh, an opportunity for both those guys in the NFL. Uh, this is a fantastic question that is coming from upstate New York. Guys, I'm a University of Virginia graduate, 2006. Please talk about this. Where's the next victory going to come from on this schedule? Interestingly, that was a topic of conversation for us today. I'll rattle off the... Uh, the schedule for Virginia football, and, 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 and ladies and gentlemen, the schedule is pretty darn difficult. And this is something that Hootie Ratcliffe has covered all year long on this talk show about how the season gets more difficult. Hootie, you got North Carolina on the 21st of October coming out of the bye week in Chapel Hill, and UNC looks like the real deal. Then they traveled to South Florida to face the U, who suffered what look like one of the worst coaching decisions I've ever seen to run the football instead of kneeing the football that leads to a turnover and a Georgia Tech victory. Speaking of Georgia Tech, you got the Yellow Jackets on the 4th of November in Scott Stadium. Then you got uh, Louisville in a quick turnaround on Thursday night on national TV ESPN, another nationally televised game for this Virginia football team. Then you close with Duke, who's pretty darn good, and then the season concludes with Virginia Tech and Scott Stadium. Here's how, it, here's, here's how the season plays out. UNC Chapel Hill, in Chapel Hill, Miami and South Florida, the Ramblin' Wreck in Charlottesville, Louisville at Louisville, Duke in Charlottesville, and Virginia Tech in Charlottesville. Where's the win come from? It's definitely a backloaded schedule. Backloaded. And I, I think they've got their best two shots, I think, from here on out are the Georgia Tech game here. Georgia Tech, I don't think Georgia Tech has won here since 1990 when they won that uh, infamous <laughs> uh, close game. Uh, Scott Sisson kicked the field goal and, and 
ripped the hearts out of every Virginia fan uh, when the Cavaliers are ranked number one in the country. I think that's their next best shot. And then I think Virginia Tech here to end the season because it's here. Um, and you know, Tech may get better. I don't. I don't know. But right now, they're struggling almost as mightily as Virginia is. So it, it could come down to that. Um, you know, Miami is as good as they are. Are, are. They seem to be vulnerable. Cristobal hasn't won a conference home game uh, in his tenure down there. Uh, should have had that one the other night. All they had to do was take a knee, and they would have gotten it. But uh, you ever seen a coaching mistake like that? Seldom, seldom, particularly on that level. That, that, that's why you don't do things like that right. because anything they, can happen. They just showed you how to lose a football game when you no no excuse for losing a football game. Um, and you know, to his credit, he took the blame. Yeah, and it wasn't really his call. It was the offensive coordinator who called it exactly. and, and owned it, Right. which I admire that at least they, he owned it. And then the head coach goes, I should have overrun the call. He should have. I mean, he, he fell on the spear. He, he, he didn't have to. And But uh, a head coach can overrule a play call, and particularly in a situation like that where – you know, it's the last play of the game. You're, throw, you're throwing away a game. You're right. throwing away a win, and it's hard to win when you do everything right, let alone when you make a, a dumb decision. So um, Miami can be vulnerable if they begin losing because that's one program where you see the, the guys just kind of lose heart when things aren't going their way. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it because it's at Miami, but, you know, the, that's a possibility, and uh, it sounds like Riley Leonard's coming back at quarterback for Duke. Maybe not this week against NC State, but so, probably sooner than later. So uh, I think Duke will be back up to full strength pretty soon. And Louisville was very impressive the other night against Notre Dame. Just took Notre Dame to the to the to the Woodhouse and gave him a good spanking. But um, so they're they're a little bit better than I thought they were going to be, and North Carolina's got it together. They not only is their offense clicking with Drake May, but Gene Chizik's defense shut down a really good Syracuse offense the other day, uh, an offense that was averaging about 40 points a game, and they held them to a touchdown. So uh, I don't I don't see it happening in Chapel Hill, and when they get back into action, but. Hopefully this win will get them to where they are motivated and they can at least take it into the fourth quarter and have a chance. I'll give the viewers and listeners a stat here. There's three overall undefeated teams in the ACC. Louisville is 6-0, and Florida State's 5-0, and North Carolina's 5-0. and UVA plays two of the three in Louisville and UNC. When you're looking at conference records, there's four unblemished teams in the Atlantic Coast Conference, Louisville, Florida State, North Carolina, and Duke, and UVA plays three of the four. Yep. Louisville is the highest scoring team right now in the ACC at 218 total points. This team could put up some offense. I was, I mean, you know this sport better than I do. I was shocked to see Louisville and what they did to Notre Dame. Oh, they just, they dominated them in every phase of the game, and I didn't think Notre Dame was as good as advertised, but I didn't think Louisville was either. But Louisville, uh, Jeff Brom has done a great job. Uh, you know, it was it was funny last year when Louisville came to Virginia. A lot of people thought that Scott uh, Satterfield, their coach, if he lost that game, would be fired when he got back to Louisville that night. Um, but instead, he won, and from there, they turned their season completely around. So you, you got to give Satterfield a lot of the credit for getting that program back on track. They went on and went to a bowl game, and then he got out of there, and they brought back Jeff Brom, who was a quarterback there back in the day, and he's hired uh, at least one of his brothers, maybe two of them, uh, in their program. And so they have a lot of pride in that program, and uh, to see them not shy away but uh, be aggressive and, and just handle Notre Dame with ease in the second half 
was very impressive. Uh, they they handled Notre Dame a lot easier than Ohio State did. Uh, questions for the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer. Put them in the feed. The questions are coming in fast and furious. This is a uh, question that uh, I'm hesitant to ask, but I will anyway because I respect the viewers and listeners' time and the energy they put in. Questions are coming in quickly here, Hootie. Um, how would you characterize the warmth or hotness of Coach Elliott's seat? Well, it cooled off a little bit this past weekend totally. because they, they finally snapped the nation's second longest losing streak of eight games. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's hard to measure that at this point of the season because there, there are possibilities for wins down the road. Uh, it's only happened once in Virginia history that a coach was fired after his second season, I think, and uh, that was Coach Randall back in the 70s. But there were some – Extenuating some, circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That we won't go into here. But uh, I, I, it would be rare for that to happen, although today's modern football is, is not like it was before. We've seen coaches ousted in the middle of the seasons in college football. I don't think anything like that's going to happen. But, um, you know, a lot of the pressure falls on Carla Williams and, and what uh, how she can maneuver the situation around the heavy hitters and the fans because a lot of it is if, if people don't come to games and they're losing bleeding money from not having a, a decent crowds, that can have an impact. Uh, sometimes heavy hitters will stop donations and stuff if to apply pressure. So um, Tony Elliott hasn't done anything to embarrass himself or the program or the university, and he really tries. He busts his butt every week. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think he's on the hot seat. Uh, that could change, but I think right now. I think his job is secure heading into a third season. I think you just handled that professionally perfectly well, and I concur with what you just said. And I understand that the final six games are going to be fairly difficult. And there is a legitimate chance here that it could be a one-win season. There's a legitimate could, chance it that be. it could be a two-win season. But I think this guy is going to have a third year of coaching football. Um, and, and a key for, for this team and this program, and I hate to say this, may be – um, the rebuild through the transfer portal. Yeah, and they can help themselves greatly through the portal if, if they can do the right research, find the right guys, and, and persuade them to come here. Um, we're, again, we're dealing with NIL, which uh, if they get into a recruiting war for a guy in the portal, some of them are looking for a place to play or to succeed. Some are looking for a paycheck. A lot of them are looking for a paycheck. And so, um, you know, we're, we're not totally attuned to what UVA's NIL deals are. I think it's probably a little better than, than uh, they like to talk about, but it's certainly not on the level of a lot of schools around the country, not, nowhere close. I just saw last week where I can't remember the program, but Every uh, player on the football team, I think, or at least all the Is starters. That got a truck? Got a truck, brand yeah. new truck. So I saw that. You're not going to see that happen here. Uh, maybe not anywhere in the ACC, except possibly Florida State. But it's um, that's something that they really need to, and I'm sure they're addressing it, is that they need to focus on, on the portal and see what they can do because – you know, recruiting is a huge, huge part of this. And if you're not succeeding in getting high school kids, as the previous uh, questioner asked, uh, you know, the portal is the answer. And that, that's something that they could really use to help the program. Stefan, watching the program in Richmond, Virginia, he says, just look at this schedule and how many games are on national TV. They've got to loosen the academic standards or this program is going to struggle and the brand is going to suffer. I'm going to piggyback on what he just said. <coughs> He's watching in Richmond. you got University of Tennessee and the University of Virginia, the opener national, uh, national TV on ABC. 
the JMU game was on ESPNU. I don't know if we want to call that national TV or not. A lot of households do get ESPNU. You had Maryland on a Friday night. That was on Fox Sports 1. That's national TV. Hmm. You got NC State. That was national TV on a Friday night on ESPN. Boston College game was not national TV. That was on the CW. The Wee and Mary game was on the ACC Sports Network. I'm not going to call that national TV. You got uh, North Carolina and Chapel Hill on the CW. That's not national TV. We don't know the, the broadcasting yet for Miami or Georgia Tech. They are on national TV Thursday night against Louisville. And you would imagine, although the teams are struggling, that Virginia Tech game is going to get some uh, play on TV because it's the Commonwealth Clash. And it's got regional and East Coast implications here. So to Stefan's point here, the brand is being broadcasted countrywide on big-time networks. And I'll piggyback on what he's saying. If we don't make it more advantageous to log or register victories with recruiting, then the brand could continue to suffer. Anywhere you want to go on that topic. Well, I've, I've talked about that over the years, and it, it seems like it, it's a, a waste of time because I don't think the University of Virginia is going to yield on their stance. A lot of their alumni don't want them to yield because they feel like it cheapens their diploma. Personally, I don't, I don't think it does because uh, you look at some other schools that Virginia is on par with academically, and... Uh, I don't. I don't think. I think they have some concessions for football that they don't for. Uh, but you know, I mean, just look at, at North Carolina. Uh, not to put down their academics because they're they're on par with UVA now in the latest U.S. News and World Report college rankings. In fact, I think they might have even passed Virginia in those rankings. But. Um, there are some schools, uh, some academic schools, and uh, a couple of them in the ACC that I know of who have made some concessions when it comes to football to help get players into the program, help keep players in the program. I mean, we and, saw this. And it hasn't UNC's hurt. It hasn't stained their academic reputation one iota. Exactly. We saw this not only with the UNC with the football team, but with the basketball team. I mean, we saw Rashad McCants got into some trouble for this when Roy Williams was the head basketball coach. Yeah. And, and these guys, you know, this led to a full-fledged NCAA investigation. The, the, and, and we're not saying anything like this for UVA, but in the UNC scenario, and he's right, the U.S. The, uh, world, uh, the US News and World Report rankings, you got UNC, and I'm looking at the rankings in front of me right now, neck and neck with the University of Virginia, and less than a decade ago, maybe a decade ago, McCants and the basketball team were in the national news about him not going to class and him having tutors taking tests and, and writing papers for him. Well, and they're, they're, they, they weren't going to one class because it didn't even exist. It didn't even have think. a class. <laughs> right. But they were getting grades for it. Uh, their attorneys did a great job of getting them out of trouble there. But, um, I, I mean, I, I know for a fact that there are some other academic institutions who have – lessen the burden on some of those football players so that they can be successful in football. I won't, I won't name names, at least not on the air, but um, I know it because I've, I know the coaches. I've talked to some of them, and uh, that's just the way it is. And, and, again, it hasn't stained their diplomas or, or, or anything one, one bit. And it's not just in the ACC. It's around the country. Uh, some won't budge on it. Uh, but some have, and again, it doesn't. It really doesn't hurt your school's reputation academically. You're still going to get the cream of the crop to fill out the, your population, and you know, I, I just think I, Virginia's been stubborn about that. I, I don't think they're going to change, and I, I think that's something that, a hard reality that they're going to have to look at is. Do we really want a successful football program? And what can we do to make it that way? They, they've got to look hard at the NIL. They've got to look hard at uh, maybe creating some places to put athletes or particularly football players that 
they can get a, still get a good education and, and stuff that they're more attuned to academically that, that maybe the other, rest of the student body isn't that interested in. But uh, there's a lot of schools that have done things like that. And uh, I think it's Stanford or Cal that has, a, I think, a, a, a major in a hotel management or something like that. But uh, there, there's a lot of ways to do it. And it doesn't really hurt your academic reputation at all. And um, it, again, it's something that Virginia's got to sit down and examine. Uh, their answer is, it seems like their answer to everything is just pour some money on it, like um, building the new football facility, which will help, and the jumbotron at the stadium and, and things like that. Uh, they're nice amenities, but uh, some of that's like putting lipstick on a pig. And it's window dressing. It's window dressing, and you know that's that's not going to win you football games. It's not going to get you recruits. The buildings might because it shows a commitment to the student athlete, but they got to go beyond that and look at the other reasons why. And I, I know a lot of I've heard a lot of people on Twitter talk about this that Virginia needs to make some changes if they want to win in football. And a lot of the a lot of the people graduates don't want don't care about that. They don't care about football at all, and uh, they don't want any. I don't want to make any concessions of any kind. So it's it's a dilemma. Uh, it goes back into the 50s. Um, I've talked to some guys who coached back then, and they said that, you know, they want us to be Harvard Monday through Friday and Alabama on Saturdays, and it just doesn't work that way. 100% right. Jerry Ratcliffe dropping dimes today. We'll take two more questions here on the uh, Tuesday edition of the Jerry and Jerry Show. This one comes from um, Twitter, and it's a fantastic question. Does Jerry Ratcliffe think the, uh, and you've touched on this already, the new infrastructure builds will have an impact, or is that just, as you guys have said, window dressing? I'll add to this question right here. It's not just the new infrastructure build. It's not just the scoreboard. Um, I think it's even perhaps more important creating an NIL um, pipeline or stream of income for the players because it seems to me, and you're the expert, that's what's truly attracting the guys, the programs to transfer. It is, and, and even to some of the better recruits as well out of high school. But uh, I don't think that the, I think the new building, um, and I shot some video of that the other day, I'll have to put it up on the website, but it's it's coming along really quickly. It'll be open next spring. I, I don't think that's window dressing. I, I think the other stuff that they're talking about is. But I, I think the building is truly a commitment to the football program. It's something that they needed. Uh, George Welsh, went, bless his soul, uh, when he was still alive, I'd see him over there. He'd be getting a cup of coffee in the McHugh Center uh, when Bronco was still here, and I'd sit down and talk to George, and he said they, they've really got to do something about a new facility for the football program. And he was right, and that's something that Al Grove talked about. It's something that Mike London talked about. It's something that Bronco Mendenhall mentioned in his acceptance introductory speech when he came here. Uh, you're in an arms race against all your rivals and everybody in your conference, and part of that race is the facilities. And this new building is going to do a lot of things. It, the, it's a home for this for the football players. They can do all their weightlifting in the building, study in the building, study hall uh, in the building, get tutors in the building. They can eat in the building. Uh, they have lounges there, uh, all sorts of cool stuff for the players. It, it's just a home away from home, and they can get it all. It's one-stop shopping, essentially. And Virginia had fallen so far behind the rest of the ACC in that department that this is definitely going to help. You can now bring a recruit in and show him this is, this is where you're going to be. This is how you can spend your time here. And it's very important. Uh, 
You never know what's going to impress an 18-year-old. I remember when Bill Dooley was the head coach at Wake Forest, and we were on the ACC football tour, and we were having lunch with him in their cafeteria one day, along with all the football players. And uh, Coach Dooley said, uh, he said, I want to make sure all you boys stop and get an ice cream cone before you leave here today. <laughs> he said, that ice cream cone got me a, a four-star recruit. He said, and it lost me a four-star recruit because a guy came here and then uh, ate with us and then went somewhere else and committed to the other place. And I asked him why he committed. And he said, well, they have an ice cream machine, <laughs> coach, and you don't. <laughs> and so he said, you boys make sure you get an ice cream cone and mention that in your stories this week. <laughs> this week. So, again, you never know what what's going to Impress an 18-year-old. This question, the final one for you here. The Virginia Sports Hall of Famer guy is the publisher of jerryratcliffe.com. Um, and you may not know the answer to this one. I certainly do not. Do we know the football player who's got the best NIL package or uh, financing stream on this year's roster? And that's coming from Laura, who's watching in Newport News. Laura, I wish I could give you the answer to that, but I can't because I simply don't know, and I don't know that if – anybody knows that's not involved in the that specific program so they don't really make that public and they don't like to talk about it from what i understand <laughs> i mean even just from optics it doesn't even seem like there's any significant i mean who would it be I, I don't know. I mean, I know Brendan Armstrong was the guy last year. He was all over McDonald's, he Brendan Armstrong last year. all over McDonald's. Uh, and he had a couple other deals going with some other places. Um, so I, I really don't know the answer to that. I don't know who it would be. Uh, I'm sure they have some guys getting some NIL help, but I don't know who and I don't know how much, and I, I don't know that anybody does or any of us ever will know. And, you know, the interesting thing about this is maybe it should be something that's publicized more because we're seeing a lot of the other big-time programs talk about how their star talent is making this much money or getting this kind of shiny stuff, and that's creating buzz on social media, which is being seen by other athletes that may enter the transfer portal or talented high school athletes. I mean, you talk Bo Nix. You talk uh, Deion Sanders' son, the quarterback. I mean, it's clearly been reported on College Game Day or on SportsCenter, the money they're making every year. And that builds buzz for the program. Maybe it's something that should be publicized. I don't know. That's just my two cents. Or maybe my, if you're not getting, giving out a lot of money, you, you, do, keep you it don't on the want DL. to publicize. <laughs> there so. it is. Okay, you, you just probably nailed it. Right I there. think that's probably nailed it right there. That's probably, Jerry Ratcliffe just nailed it. That's exactly what's happening. If there's not that much going through, you don't want to talk about it. I think that's why they, one of the reasons they brought in Wally Walker uh, is to examine this and try to see what can be done to enhance that for Virginia because it's something that they're going to have to deal with. Uh, you can't just stick your head in the sand and pretend it's not an issue because I don't think it's going away anytime soon. No. And, uh, if anything, it's going to be more impactful. You, you would think. And so uh, I, I think that's they probably brought him in with his financial expertise to try to figure out some new avenues. Uh, Jerry Ratcliffe, guys, absolutely on fire. The namesake of jerryratcliffe.com, the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer. My friend, some closing thoughts for your fans? Uh, well, you know, it, it's a bye week, so there's not a lot going on with football. We'll be uh, – focusing a little bit more on basketball this week and the blue-white scrimmage for the men and the women are this, this weekend at JPJ. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Coach Venn's uh, cross-country team is hosting, I guess, the national cross-country championships this weekend, early Saturday morning. Uh, check out coverage uh, for that. And... Um, yeah, it's just an interesting time of the year where we're not that far away from football and basketball crossing over, and uh, November can be a, a very active month, that's for sure. And we're not that far away. JerryRatcliffe.com, the website. We're on it every day. JerryRatcliffe.com. Get on the website if you want to follow the orange and blue. You booked Jason Williford today. Fantastic interview. Fun, a lot of fun. Jason's a good guy and a fun guy. Great guy, fantastic interview. Judah Wickhauer, props to you. Yes, sir. Um, you saw, uh, saw an element of creativity to start the program from one Scott Ratcliffe. Scott, nothing but love for you. 
Um, great to have you on the team, Scott Ratcliffe. You are, are a man of many, many, many talents, Scott Ratcliffe. For Judah, for Scott, for Hootie, this is the Jerry and Jerry Show on a Tuesday. It was on absolute fire today. Thank you kindly for joining us on this network. And the I Love Seville Show, my friends, is up in 56 minutes. Take care, everybody. Same to you, my friend.